All right. Welcome, everybody. My name is Kyle Magatelli. I am the social media and webinar coordinator for Student Doctor Network. We are very happy today to be joined by Dr. Valentina Bonev uh, to do an Ask Me Anything webinar about breast surgery oncology. So, Dr. Bonev, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So excited to be here. Awesome. Looking forward to learning about a field that I know pretty much nothing about. <laughs> So we're gonna give everyone a minute or two to trickle in. Uh, before we get started with talking about your field, I wanted to really quickly run through some of Student Doctor's resources. So Student Doctor Network is, we're a nonprofit and we are committed to delivering resources to healthcare students from every pre-profession so that they can achieve their goals of becoming healthcare professionals. Everyone should have access to the resources necessary to succeed and become a healthcare provider. Uh, we have free resources that you can find. Go to studentdoctor.net. It's a lot better to go on there than listen to me talk about things. At the top of the screen, there's a resources page. Hop on there, poke around. Best thing you can do to learn. Uh, one thing that I get a lot of use out of our confidential expert advice. This is in our forums. If you have questions, about, there's, there's providers, ad comms, there's a lot of experts on there. If you need straight direct answers, this is the place to go. I would highly recommend it if you have a question that you want a very direct and correct answer to. Uh, the pre-med planner app. If you're a pre-med I would suggest downloading this because it has an hours tracker. The absolute last thing you need to do is lose track of your clinical hours. Go on there. It helps you everything from like day one of being an undergrad to when you're submitting into Abcast. This is there to help you stay on track. Uh, the med school app cost calculator. I really don't like thinking about how much med school applications will cost, but it's a reality. Go on there. Get out ahead of this one, guys. Do not get blindsided by this. Uh, the Becoming a Student Doctor course. This is a course offered by the Health Professional Student Association. This is, it's a great way to learn about uh, different aspects of healthcare that you may not be thinking about right now as a pre-med and the things that healthcare professionals are going to be focused on in the decades to come, as well as being able to articulate why you want to do this and working in, uh, learning about the core companies competencies the AAMC is looking for. It's a really great course, uh, hpsa.org. It, well, it's right up there. I don't know why I'm trying to read it off. Our YouTube channel, we have a whole lot of webinars, Ask Me Anything. We did a couple of uh, webinars with the AAMC about financing your medical education, as well as your path to med school. So if you're not already in med school, highly recommend those, a lot of useful information. Uh, in the event you're already a med student or uh, a provider, um, thank you for bearing with me through all this stuff, but last couple of things, MD applicants, go on here, find out how you're stacking up, probably should remove DDS, but too late now, and Lizzie M, this is a great way to find out where you are the most competitive. You absolutely want to make sure you're applying at schools, you're a good mission fit match for statistically. Uh, SA Workshop 101 does what it says on the tin. Go on there, learn how to be a better writer. Review two, testing site reviews. This way you know, like, is there something goofy about the testing site you're going to? Well, this is where you're gonna find out. You can find us on all the socials. Uh, there it is. I have talked more than enough. We're gonna get that over with. And again, Dr. Bonov, thank you for being here to talk to us. I'm gonna switch the view Absolutely. here. And first question, and guys, if you have questions, populate them for us, please, so that we can ask the expert. Uh, when did you first decide to become a physician and why? I knew that I was always interested in medicine and diseases. Um, like when we were in high school and biology course, whenever a certain like illness came up or a disease, I just was really interested and my, my um, ears kind of perked up. And um, in college, when I was taking uh, my biology courses, the same thing. I, I was most drawn to that. And so um, I would say I really knew more so when I was an undergrad and I was being involved in the clinical settings, such as shadowing or volunteering at a free clinic. 
and working with the patient, that's when I really realized, you know what, I really do want to be a doctor. So I would say when I was for sure knew that I wanted to be a doctor when I was in college. Awesome. So next question, how and why did you choose the medical school you attended besides you got in there? <laughs> So I went to UCI or University of California, Irvine as an undergrad. And I also went to UC Irvine uh, for medical school. Uh, both campuses are right there, right next to each other. So I was already exposed to the medical school as an undergrad. I did research on the medical school campus. I worked with some of the doctors in the research lab who also worked at the hospital where the um, students and residents train. So I had some exposure and I really liked working with the uh, medical students and residents and the uh, physicians there. And so I knew that I wanted to go to UCI the way they had um, the curriculum, uh, the hospitals, the clinical settings where the students um, had to go to. I felt like that aligned with what I was looking for. The school is also not a super big school. So I, I found out later that there are medical schools where there's well over 200 students. And um, when I was a student, our class was 104 people um, uh, our first year. So that's, a, it's a pretty good size, but it's not super huge. So I also like that it was, to me, it felt more like a bit of a more intimate setting and I felt like I didn't get lost in the mix. Also, um, we would have our big lecture hall um, courses led by the professors, but then we would always get broken up into groups and we would go to these study rooms and we would have um, almost like a one-on-one -on -one interaction with um, a physician coming from the hospital who would uh, follow up what we learned in the course. And so there would just be a handful of us in the room and then we had the physician. So that was nice too. So I liked that. I, did, I didn't feel like I was just a number. I was getting sort of uh, lost in there. And uh, yeah, so I got into UCI and I'm, I'm really happy <laughs> that I went there. Yeah, I mean, any UC is gonna be crazy competitive. So that's a get right there. Right. <laughs> what surprised you the most about your studies? Um, it is really a long road to becoming a doctor. And then after you finish medical school, yes, you are a medical doctor, you're an MD, but then you have to go into residency training. And uh, I did general surgery, so that was five years. And then I chose to specialize in uh, breast surgical oncology. So then I did a one-year fellowship on top of that. So to really get to the point where I am today uh, was including undergrad. So when you're pre-med and when you're applying is well over a 10 year process. It, it's a long time. It's, it's really, you have to think of it as a marathon. You have to really be dedicated. You have to plan very well. I feel like being goal oriented and creating a timeline for you um, helps you. Um, there's just, there's just a lot of material. The first day of medical school, one of the slides was <clears throat> saying that the amount of information you're going to learn is like if you're trying to drink from a hose that the fireman turned, in, turned on from the hydrant. It's literally so much information. It's, it's literally overload. And that's what medical school is about. And you have to determine, okay, it's pretty much impossible to learn everything. But I'm going to hone in and figure out what's the most important and then try to grasp as much as I can. And then um, what was also surprising or I, I, I mean, I was warned that in residency, you're going to do long shifts. You're going to work very long hours in the hospital, including overnight shifts. And that was true. And we worked 24 hour shifts or even up to 30 hour shifts. And that was that was hard. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I feel like in medical school, it was, it was just so much to learn. And in residency, it's the same thing. And then on top of it, just really long days and nights. But I, I somehow made it. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Dr. Bona, real quick, uh, we're getting a little bit of distortion or clipping. Uh, is your microphone or what have you plugged in all the way? I uh, wanted to ask. It is. Can you hear me now? 
Yeah, we're still getting a little bit of clipping though. Clipping. Uh, here, I have another microphone I can switch out to. Okay, thank you. Uh, apologies for the technical Sorry. delays, guys. It wasn't doing this before we went live, so go figure. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, still getting a little bit of clipping, so uh, we did everything we could. All right, thank you for being accommodating there. Let me make sure other tabs are closed. Yeah, I don't have anything else. Do you still hear clipping? Yes, I believe this is just one of the mysteries of life at this point. Okay. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I don't know where that's coming from. I don't have anything on except a, a light on. That's it. Ah, no worries. Thank you. Um, well, moving on. Uh, Laura Turner is wondering, this is a good question. How did you learn to manage your time in medical school? I would like to know how you did this. I think I'm, I'm pretty good at time management. I'm not one of those people who procrastinated who pulled an all-nighter to study for exam, who waited until the last minute. So I naturally had that going for me. But uh, like I mentioned earlier, having your goals, setting up a timeline, um, when you're going to complete it, that helped me pace myself. So when I knew I had a big exam, let's say in about a week or so, I mean, I would start planning and say like, okay, by Wednesday, I need to make sure I go through chapters one through three and make sure I answer this amount of questions and and just to keep keep track that I'm you know reaching my goal because I don't want to wait until the last minute and then it's panic mode trying trying to learn as much as you can but you're like in a frenzy <clears throat> okay uh, next question and that's good advice right there why did you decide to pursue your specialty? So when I was a medical student, I, uh, my first rotation was surgery. Um, and uh, at the very beginning of my rotation, uh, I was on the surgical oncology uh, unit. And I happened to be linked up with a couple of attendings. One of them was a breast surgeon, another one. Um, did a lot of breast surgery as well. And I really connected with them. I thought they were great people. And then I thought they were also great physicians as well. And I really enjoyed working with them. Um, through them, I got involved in a breast uh, cancer project, um, which I, later I ended up uh, presenting at a national conference. And I was really excited about learning about breast cancer. I was really excited working in the operating room with these attendings. I enjoyed surgery. I enjoyed the uh, pathophysiology, the disease process. I also enjoyed the clinic time and seeing how the attendings interacted with the patient. So I really fell in love with breast surgery through my um, surgery rotation as a third year medical student. And, uh, and I knew that if I wanted to be a breast surgeon, I'd have to do general surgery residency. So um, that's what led me to apply to surgery residency. And I still wanted to be a breast surgeon and that led me to fellowship and here I am today. Awesome, thank you. So question from WW, what are the pros and cons of being in your specialty? I honestly love my specialty. I'm so happy I went into it. Um, I, I mean, I really love everything about it. I love the type of surgeries I do, the patients I see. I love that it's not like a one and done type of specialty. What I mean is um, <clears throat> oftentimes you may have patients that, for example, you see for a hernia, you do, you do their hernia surgery, and then you see them one time post-op, and then you never see them again. My patients, I see almost all my patients for very long term, even those that I've operated on, and I really appreciate that continuity I have with them and helps build rapport with them. I feel like they're more confident in the medical system and in me because we essentially built this like long-term relationship, and I feel like there's trust both ways. And um, I, I think that's great. <clears throat> I also enjoy that 
course, I deal with breast cancer patients, but I also see a lot of benign breast disease, like breast pain and breast cysts. So I like that variety. Again, I love operating. I love the surgeries I do. In terms of the cons, I don't, I, cons per se in my specialty, I can't really pick any cons that are particular to my specialty. I think the downside, one of the downsides in medicine, it can be, um, maybe difficult planning surgeries or sending patients to particular specialties because of insurance, but that wouldn't be uh, due to my specialty. But I have to say, like, I, I really love being a breast surgeon. Awesome. So next question is what training is needed to become a breast surgery oncologist or even just a breast surgeon? What training is needed for that? The oncology part, is that like a whole different proverbial ball of wax? So if you want to be a breast surgical oncologist or a breast surgeon, you first have to do general surgery residency, um, which is a five-year program. And then after that, um, or, or at the end of residency, you apply for fellowship, which is breast surgical oncology, and that's a one-year fellowship. So I did my fellowship at Northwestern uh, University Medical Center, and that's in Chicago, Illinois, and it's the hospital is the top 10 hospital in the U.S. and excellent program, excellent training, had an amazing time. And then um, after I completed my training, I'm a full-fledged breast surgical oncologist. Now, there are some doctors out there who after surgery residency, they did a surgical oncology fellowship, um, and that is, um, I believe, a two-year fellowship. The difference with that is that you are um, learning how to take care of patients, not only with breast cancer, but with all different types of uh, surgical cancers, such as melanoma, colon cancer, rectal cancer, stomach cancer. Um, so you don't really just focus on the one area, although a sur surgical oncologists tend to kind of have their like one or two areas they, that they really focus on, but then they still do a lot of operating on other cancers. So if you there, so the point is you can still be a breast surgeon, those two paths, but if you really want to be completely a hundred percent dedicated to breast surgery, you want to do a breast surgical oncology fellowship, which is what I did. Um, <clears throat> now you can quote unquote, be a breast surgeon, um, after general surgery training. However, you're not full fledged spe uh, specialized. You did not do that extra training that extra uh, studies. You can still do breast surgery as a general surgeon, but you're probably not gonna do that many uh, breast surgeries in your practice because you're gonna be seeing a lot of patients with gallbladder issues and doing cholecystectomies and operating on hernias and um, uh, colon cancer and so forth. Um, so if you really wanted to be a fellowship dedicated uh, specialist, you want to go ahead and do that fellowship. And so all I do and see every day is breast. All I operate on is breast and I love it. That's exactly what I want. I feel, I mean, I'm so specialized and I know exactly what to do when I see a patient with a breast concern and I'm not kind of also focusing on, you know, taking care of melanoma patients and colon cancer, it's just so much, but I get to put all my energy and time just into breast disease. And I think that's amazing. And patients love seeing someone who's truly specialized and had uh, extra training uh, to help uh, treat them with their disease. Awesome. So I, oh. Got a question from L.E. I like this. I'm about to apply to Gen Surge, and I'm pretty certain I want to do a fellowship in breast surge onc. Do you feel that when interviewing, it is okay to disclose this knowing Gen Surge residency is five years? I think that it's appropriate to say that because you could say, you know, I'm applying to general surgery because I'm really interested in breast surgery. Um, and you can say, like, reason why like maybe you did research or you worked with an attending and um i think you also want to say that you are open to you know learning about um everything there is in general surgery because that includes not only breast surgery but of course you're going to learn vascular surgery transplant surgery um, colorectal surgery i think it's it's good to state you have that interest 
Um, and then you knowing that, okay, things could change and that's totally normal. You can go into medical school or uh, residency thinking you're gonna be this type of doctor. And then by the end, you may have changed based on your experience and that's totally fine. But yeah, I think it's fine to say because that shows that you have interests. It shows that you've probably worked with someone or you've had some sort of experience and um, you're not just saying you want to be a breast surgeon and you know nothing about it. I think that that helps you and, you know, helps you stand out. Awesome. So just to clarify, five years residency, one year fellowship, correct? Yes. So six years of training plus the four years of medical school, that's 10 years. <laughs> and I just want to note, I did four years of medical school. Some people did one or two years of research, dedicated research time during medical mm. school because they were going into like ENT or some, some sort of specialty where they felt like they really needed to do research um, to get into uh, the residency program that they wanted to. Um, and then also note, I only did five years of general surgery residency, but there are um, general surgery residency programs out there like at USC or UCLA, where you're required to do at least one, if not two years of dedicated research time. So you could be doing um, an extra, I mean, your surgery residency could be seven years and your medical school could be five years. So we we're, we're could be talking 10 plus years, depending on the path you're going through. <laughs> Okay, that's a lot of time. Well, I mean, in my experience, time just goes faster and faster as you get older. So at least there's that during the process. Uh, so one last comment from LE to, to um, confirm. Sounds like you were passionate about breast surgical oncology as a med student as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's when I really got exposed and I got that experience. I got that hands-on practice and wasn't just kind of hearing about it or, or maybe uh, having someone kind of talk to me about it. It's like, no, I was actually operating. I was actually doing breast surgery and assisting uh, the surgeon. I was doing the research. I was, you know, really involved. And that's how I realized, you know, I really enjoy this. Like, I think this is the path I want to go through. And I, I'm really happy I did. Awesome. So another question from WW, whoops. Uh, okay, what was it like performing your first solo surgery? That's an interesting question. That's a good question. So when you're in training in residency and fellowship, you always have an attending surgeon that you're working with, whether you're in the operating room or clinic. Sometimes you can't be operating alone, but your attending is, is nearby um, and your decision-making you can make your own decisions, but you always run it by your attending. So once you finish your training and you actually go out into the real world and um, you're, you're on your own, um, <clears throat> you know, if you are part of a group, you may initially start uh, operating uh, with a partner. Uh, but for me, it, it was just, just me, me, myself and I, uh -oh. and I was wondering to myself before my first solo surgery, how am I gonna feel? Because I don't have like that crutch of having an attending with me. And you know, I, I did great. And the reason is because I had such great training and my fellowship fully and completely prepared me. If I did not do fellowship and I had done general surgery residency only, and I had to do a breast surgery after that, I, I don't think I would have felt as confident and as prepared. So doing my first solo surgery was awesome. It went well, and I was like, okay, I'm ready to do this. Let's go. Awesome. So next question, what does it take to become a diplomate of the American Board of Surgery? Is it diplomate? I think I said Dipl that right. Diplomat. It's okay. It's okay. So, uh, so first off, what is a diplomat of the American Board of Surgery? This means you are board certified. 
So to get board certified, it is, uh, it's a long process. There's a lot that's involved, but to give you an overview, first you have to complete your general surgery residency. And within residency, you have to make sure you pass each year. You have to do um, this meet require like making sure you're able to suture and you're going to the lectures and taking care of patients and you know just following through. There's all these kind of little checkpoints that your program makes sure make sure that you're doing. You also have to do um, endoscopy training, so that's like with the EGD or a colonoscopy and do testing for that. There's also laparoscopic training you have to do and pass a test for that. And mind you, I don't do laparoscopic surgery as a, as a breast surgeon because it's not <laughs> indicated. So I still had to do all these things like um, training for a colonoscopy and so forth, even though I knew I was never, ever going to use it again. But it's part of the training. It's part of it to be board certified in surgeon uh, in surgery. So, um, so there's a number of things that you have to do. So once you meet all those requirements, you graduate um, surgery residency, um, you then um, have to take your boards. So for surgery, there are two boards you have to take. First is the written boards, which is a question-based test with like four or five answers. And the test itself is around eight hours. Um, I think it was like around 250 questions. So it's very intensive. And um, of note, there's only a couple of breast questions on that huge test. So you're being tested on all of uh, surgery. And then after you pass that, you have to take the oral boards. And the oral boards is um, kind of like this format right now, except Kyle would be asking me clinical scenarios and we would be in a virtual format. And um, I would be telling him my workup and what I would do to treat the patient. And then Kyle will be asking me like, okay, like what type of suture are you going to be using? Tell me what surgery you're going to be doing. Okay. The CT scan showed this, what do you want to do? So that exam also is testing all of your surgery knowledge. So you're lucky if you get a breast um, clinical scenario, or at least I wanted a breast clinical scenario because obviously I, I specialize it. So I'm definitely going to know that really well, but you're going to be tested on vascular surgery, colon cancer, um, um, all every, everything in surgery, how, how to treat a hernia, appendicitis, appendectomies, cholecystectomies, uh, trauma. So it's, it's definitely um, very intensive. And um, once you do that and pass all of that, then you are board certified. That's it. <laughs> but I, I will say that being in, in all seriousness, being board certified is extremely important. If you look at um, like surgery, national surgery websites, um, they'll have like a page, uh, questions that patients should ask their doctor, like, you know, how, um, like, did you do fellowship training? How many years have you been doing this? The number one question at the top though, they say to ask your doctor is, are they board certified? So that means that your doctor has gone through all of this training, but not only they completed the training, they pass all of their testing and now they are deemed by the American Board of Surgery that you have achieved the highest level of standards to do surgery in the United States. So this is the, the hardest really kind of thing for you to do. So it's extremely important to be uh, board certified and, and it really does open doors for you. It opens more opportunities for you and, and uh, patients wa want to see not only a specialist and they want to see that, yes, you are board certified. You've, You've done all the training, you've met the highest standards, and they're going to feel uh, more confident in you as your, uh, to have you as a surgeon. Well, that's a lot. Okay. Thank you for walking us through that process. So going back to what you said about those time management skills and setting goals, timelines, checkpoints, it sounds like those are really great skills to have as a surgeon because of how and procedurally your, driven your work right, is. Right, right, in your whole life. And especially, for for example, with the boards, I knew my test was going to be a certain month, and I'm like, okay, it's going to be in six months or so. Like, that's how far ahead I'm thinking. I need to sign up for a course, sign up for questions. My goal is to do this amount of questions by the end of each week and then as i get closer and closer i'm you know stepping up my game changing my goals and i'm i think it's great to have a planner and you're just constantly going 
back? Are you meeting your goals? And if you're not, what do you need to do to change that? So time management is so important. Having a timeline, having goals and how you're going to meet those goals keeps you on track. And for surgery too, I always have for my patients, especially my cancer patients and the patients I'm operating on, I have essentially like a flight plan for them. Like, okay, I've seen the patient. I need to get X, Y, Z and done, uh, done for them before the surgery, meaning I, maybe I need to get a mammogram, ultrasound, an MRI. I need to refer them to a medical oncologist. I need to go through all these results with the patient. We need to determine the type of surgery. This is the surgery I'm going to do. Okay, I'm going to make sure, like, am I, is everything prepared? I have all the tools, resources. I got all the imaging, all the results in. I'm ready to go. And so... It, I'm, I'm, I'm big on planning. I like to write everything down and I still do what you do in residency, which is you have your list with your um, checks, check boxes of what you need to do. Like, okay, order potassium, you know, for the patient who has low potassium, discharge this patient, see the consult in the emergency room. And, you know, your attending will say, well, did you check your list? Did you, did you check your little box? And, you know, I still use it because it helps me stay on track. And I think that's really important because there's so many things that you have to be responsible for and keep track of. It's so easy to slip up or uh, forget something. So I have everything um, organized, written down and, you know, when I have to do it and, and uh, it helps me stay on track. Awesome. That's positive reinforcement for me because literally everything I do every day, I have a, a large checklist. So same here. Yeah. Yeah. I, if I don't write it, if, I am up a creek if I don't do that. So glad to hear that. Right. Yeah. Uh, another great question from Elle. Do you recommend any breast surgical oncology societies for medical students to join? I know that the American Society of Breast Surgeons does not have medical student memberships. Um, so you can get involved with the American College of Surgeons. I would highly recommend that. I um, was involved as a medical student um, that's when I, uh, the American College of Surgeons is actually who I submitted my research to and I uh, presented at their annual clinical congress in Washington, D.C. And yes, they have, uh, with that particular society, medical students uh, membership um, and they even have courses and they have tons of resources for medical students. So if you go to um, uh, the American College of Surgeons website, there will be um, uh, research page just for uh, pre-med students interested in surgery, and then they have research page for medical students interested in surgery, and then they also have resources for residents uh, as well. The American Society of Breast Surgeons, uh, as far as I know, I believe you're right, they don't have any medical student memberships, but I would say um, you can still submit your research to them. They have an annual conference in the spring and you could even uh, potentially present uh, at their conference, which, which would be great experience for you and something to talk about um, in the interview trail. And you could even uh, publish in their journal or in the American College of Surgeons uh, journal. So there, there are uh, opportunities out there and you can even attend the conferences too, even if you are uh, not presenting anything, you, you can uh, just go to learn, that would be a great uh, opportunity for you um, if, if you're able to uh, go to it. Awesome. So it sounds like this is a, a field where you're going to be doing research along the way. Is that correct? You know, not necessarily. Oh. This isn't a field where you absolutely have to do research, but I will say um, when I applied for fellowship, um, most of the applicants or at least the top applicants had research projects and or they presented at conferences or publications or had publications as did I. So um, it helped me compete with those applicants. Um, and also I was interested in research and, and the reason why is that when you're in the clinical setting or you're operating, you come up with questions. And you know why? Why did this patient have this outcome, or why? Why are you know these type of patients having these type of let's say breast cancer? And how you answer it is you do research, you investigate it, you collect data, 
and then um, see if you can produce anything that's worth publishing. That's that's great. If not, you can do quality improvement projects. So that's something that you don't necessarily uh, publish, but you're answering uh, questions to improve uh, patient uh, safety and quality of care at the hospital or center you're at. So that could be um, another sort of way you can kind of do research, but not necessarily like heavy intensive uh, research, but still learning a lot about breast surgery and, um, you know, coming up with the good outcomes for patients. Okay, awesome. Thank you for answering that. Uh, what are some of the surprises you have had while being a, I they should have said breast surgical oncologist. Like I said, I didn't know anything about your field. So I put surgeon slash oncologist. Anyway, uh, what are some of the surprises you've seen? I, well, in terms of uh, cases, I think a really interesting case that I had was a, a male breast cancer patient who actually just operated on about two weeks ago. That was a really interesting case. So by nature of my field, most of my patients are women. However, I do see some male patients and um, uh, I don't see a lot of them, but I definitely do see some male patients and um, having a male breast cancer is rare. Uh, no more than 1% uh, breast cancer case cases are uh, male. So that was a really interesting case. Um, so that's answering the question in terms of like a clinical setting. I think overall a surprise um, that's not necessarily um, uh, pertaining just to my field, just in general, and I brought this up a little bit earlier, is that insurance. Insurance does dictate um, essentially where I can operate, meaning like what surgery center, what plastic surgeon I can work with, you know, when they can get approval to come see me in the clinic, when they can get approval to get um, imaging done or see the medical oncologist and, and so forth. So that was... I think a little bit of a surprise that it can in some ways um, kind of dictate uh, the care or even prolong things. That's more for the HMO patients, though, not as much for the PPO patients. But really, pretty much everything I do has to be submitted to insurance, meaning if I order a breast MRI for a patient, I have to specify why I'm ordering it. And so, of course, you all you need a valid reason. But it can be, you know, rejected when it's reviewed by the doctors on staff at the insurance company saying, you know what, it's not clinically indicated. However, those doctors, unfortunately, are not breast specialists. And so it can be sometimes hard. You have to convince them and have all your clinical notes and, and reasoning and explaining and using guidelines from uh, national societies, like why you're doing, you know, what you're doing to convince them, like, yes, this, this patient absolutely needs this test or study done. Wow. Well, that's pretty intense. <laughs> um, how do you work with medical oncologists, uh, hem hematologists? Uh, once I, I give up. Uh, so how do you work with other medical oncologists? So I, so, um, Cancer, especially breast cancer, is multidisciplinary care. So for me, of course, I'm doing the surgery, but I am also working with a few other specialists for cancer patients. So some patients may have a plastic surgeon involved, so that's someone else that I'm working with, and uh, I work with them in the operating room. Uh, all the cancer patients are going to be sent to the medical oncologist, and so I will be sending patients uh, to the medical oncologist, and they're going to determine if the patient needs chemotherapy and or uh, possibly um, non-chemotherapy, which would be endocrine therapy, or it's also known as anti-hormonal therapy. Um, I also send patients to radiation oncologists, uh, physical therapists, uh, uh, genetic counselor. So it's a really multidisciplinary approach. Now with each of these specialists, particularly with the medical oncologist, as Laura asked, I'm, I'm talking with them about the patient. I'm telling them, hey, I saw this lady, you know, she has this type of cancer. This is what her imaging showed. This is, you know, what we discussed. My physical exam showed this. This is what I'm thinking of doing. And this is what surgery I'm planning. What do you think? Do you think she needs chemotherapy? Can we go ahead with surgery first or should she have chemotherapy first? So it's a discussion and it's an ongoing discussion. And as I get more information about the patient, 
I'm going to notify the medical oncologist and we're going to update our talk and say, okay, now that we know this, should we proceed as planned or should we change things? Should we actually do chemotherapy first? So it's, it's definitely a conversation and um, it's great because a patient has multiple specialists who are taking care of them, who are constantly reviewing their case and uh, making good informed decisions about them. So yes, I definitely work very closely with the medical oncologists on pretty much a daily basis. Awesome. So next question from YouTube, WW, do you have many opportunities to work with underserved populations? I definitely do see uh, uh, patients from the underserved populations. And unfortunately, these are the patients who tend uh, not to have as great of insurance, their um, education level is also not as great. These are the patients who tend to have noticed a breast mass and it's been there mm. for maybe six months, even a year, year plus. And after that amount of time, that's when they see me because maybe a family member urged them or they feel like, you know what, it's still growing, it's still there, it didn't go away. Because sometimes they think, oh, maybe it'll go away, especially if I change my diet. I, you know, I definitely see that with patients. And so those are the patients who tend to present with more advanced stages. And uh, they're definitely going to be seeing a medical oncologist and oftentimes um, uh, need to see or need to have uh, chemotherapy because they are uh, advanced stages. So I definitely do see patients all walks of life. I see patients all different backgrounds, cultures, races. Again, I see mainly women, but I definitely see uh, men as well. Most of my patients are adults, and I would say the age range is um, at least middle age or above, but I definitely have patients who are younger. I've operated on uh, teenagers who have come in for uh, breast masses and so I, I definitely see patients from all walks of life and I operate essentially, you know, around age 100 and then youngest age is a teenager and all different backgrounds. Interesting. Guys, thank you for the questions and the comments. Keep them coming, please. So next one, tell us please about your role as a breast cancer high risk specialist at your institution. So what it means to be high risk for breast cancer, it means that you have um, uh, risk factors that deem you high risk of developing uh, breast cancer in your lifetime. So the average risk of developing breast cancer in a woman is around uh, 12, 13%. However, if you have, let's say, a strong family history, like your mother or grandmother had breast cancer at young ages, or perhaps you inherited a uh, a genetic mutation that increases your risk of breast cancer, you're going to be deemed high risk. So I see patients who are have already been determined as high risk or uh, primary care doctors will send me patients who, let's say, have a really strong family history or they think they may have inherited a genetic mutation and they want me to determine, okay, first off, are they, are they really high risk? And uh, to determine should they have genetic testing. So I will uh, do that for my patients. I will. I'll do. I do a lot of genetic testing. I explain to them why we're doing mm. it and how it could potentially affect their um, care and also family members. So if a patient gets testing and let's say they test for a mutation with the BRCA uh, gene, so their risk of breast cancer in their lifetime could be over sixty percent, and they not only have a risk of breast cancer but also ovarian cancer. Um, also uh, pancreatic cancer, and then risk of prostate cancer. So obviously if it's a female, they're not going to get prostate cancer, but if they have any sons or uh, other males in the family, brothers, they may want to get tested too because they would change um, how they're getting screened for prostate cancer and, and pancreatic cancer as well. So it, it really does open a can of worms. So I, I manage these patients, uh, someone who's high risk for breast cancer, I see them at least twice a year. Um, we do high risk surveillance imaging. And so I follow these patients uh, closely uh, so that if they were to develop uh, breast cancer, that we're going to catch it uh, early. And then, you know, we will treat them accordingly based on their uh, risk factors. Okay. Interesting. 
What does a typical day look like for you? So it kind of varies, but I will tell you a typical day will include some sort of clinic time. So even though I'm a surgeon and love to be as much as I can in the operating room, you still have to dedicate a good amount of time uh, to clinic time because that's when you're going to see patients for consultation and determine do they, they need surgery or not. Um, so a typical day will include clinic and that's when I'm seeing patients, I'm writing notes, I'm ordering um, exams like imaging studies like mammograms, ultrasound or MRIs, I'm reviewing those results, I'm calling patients with results, um, and then I'll oftentimes uh, be operating uh, after I had uh, like a clinic in the morning. So I may operate like half a day and do that uh, a couple of times during the week. And uh, with operating, it's not just going to the operating room. It's um, preparing preoperatively for the patient. Um, you have preoperative stuff you have to do when you see the patient that day. You operate on the patient. You then have your postoperative work, which includes dictating your operative report, signing orders, prescribing uh, pain medication, uh, paperwork notes, etc., and of course seeing the patient uh, postoperatively too. Um, and then on, uh, we also have a weekly tumor board where we have a multidisciplinary discussion. So that includes all the specialists I mentioned earlier, the medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, the radiologists, of course, me and, and other surgeons are uh, part of it. And we are discussing uh, uh, patients that are either very challenging or uh, difficult cases or interesting cases. And we're going through all of their workup, including their physical exam, their imaging, and their genetic results. And we're all discussing it and we're asking questions and we're learning from each other and we're coming up with a plan um, to how to treat the, the patient as best as we can. So I'm so the typical day is definitely gonna be clinic and doing your usual clinical orders and notes and then um, uh, surgery can be tacked onto it or I'll have a full day of, of just clinic. Cool. So got another great question from LE. I appreciate the extent of teaching involved when explaining a cancer diagnosis plan to patients. What is your preferred way to do this to help empower patients and help ease their concerns? There is definitely a lot of teaching and education when you're diagnosing and explaining to a patient that they have breast cancer. So what I do is um, I go through it very methodically and I go through everything kind of like actually like a timeline. I go with the patient in the clinic. I go through all of their workup. I go, which includes all of their imaging, their biopsy, their biopsy results. I have it pulled up on the computer. I show it to them. I discuss what I see. I explain what the results are. I'm showing it to them. And then I have um, a, a paper that has a basic breast anatomy. And then I'm also explaining cancer at a, a, a cellular level. And I'm explaining the type of cancer they have how it can spread throughout the body. I'm using the little basic uh, anatomy to show them why I'm doing the surgery I recommend um, and how I'm doing it. And so I think it helps patients when I'm literally starting from zero and I'm walking all the way to where we are today with their diagnosis, instead of kind of going all over the place. Um, Definitely can be challenging with patients because when they get a breast cancer diagnosis, it's like oftentimes they're in shock. It's, it can be devastating to them. So my job is to be as calm as possible, answer their questions, try to assure them that they're not alone in this. We do have great support at the institution that I work at where we um, have a program called um, the BreastLink Angels program. And these are patients who have been treated with breast cancer, all different types of breast cancer. And they get uh, linked up with um, our cancer patients. And these are, they're matched, meaning if I have a patient who's maybe in her 30s with two small kids and has um, stage two breast cancer, they're gonna find a volunteer in, who's already had breast cancer who is also in a similar situation. So who can help um, answer those kind of like socioeconomic questions and kind of like life and what to do and with the kids and how, 
how to go to chemo, chemo's needed. And, and so then I can focus more on the biology and the surgery of things. Um, but yeah, trying to, I think, just explain everything. And you also have to adjust it to their education level and just being very patient with them. That, that's a big thing and um, trying to calm them down and let them know, you know, there are tons of women who've had the same thing you've had and we've treated them. Again, you're not gonna be alone. It's a multidisciplinary plan, a team approach, and, and, and we're gonna take care of you and keep track of you. You don't get lost. Cool. So coming up on, uh, we've got a few minutes left. Last couple of questions. Has being a physician met your expectations? I would, I would say yes, definitely. I, I think because I, I absolutely love what I do. I, I love being a surgeon. I love the clinical setting. I love the patients I see and the disease process that I'm treating. So it has met my expectations and beyond. And uh, this wouldn't have occurred if I, if I didn't really dedicate myself to breast surgery and decided that I really did want to specialize and go into fellowship. I think that if I didn't specialize and I ended up going into general surgery, I wouldn't be as happy uh, because I, I, I definitely know, especially at this point, that I, I'm glad I went to breast surgery. I absolutely love it. And I'm okay with not doing a hernia surgery <laughs> anymore. And and getting lost in the inguinal canal and, you know, having some tough cases with that or dealing with a you know, massive colon cancer. Like th those were all great, interesting cases. I enjoyed it, but I'm, I'm also really happy that I'm just super focused and, and uh, specialized with breast. And I'm, I'm really passionate about that and I'm also passionate about uh, patient and student education. So I, I think every, everything worked out and, all my expectations have been met or even beyond. Cool. So what do you like the most about being a physician and what do you like the least? I, you know, I, again, I just, not to sound like a, you know, so redundant, but I, I just, I really love what I do. I love that I'm so focused in this one area this is truly what I'm passionate about. I love operating. I, I, I think it's great. I love the part of the body I'm operating, the disease process I'm operating on. I love uh, uh, the interesting cases. I do get, you know, some patients or some people in training, like med students or residents think, oh, breast, it's easy. Like there's not much to it. No, there are actually really complicated cases we encounter. And and it's like you're kind of working through like a surgical Sudoku puzzle, you know, like it's like brain exercise and it's really interesting. And, and then not only once I, let's say, operated on a patient, seeing how, how did they do with the rest of their treatment, whether it be with chemo and or radiation and then monitoring them if they have a recurrence of breast cancer. So it's, it's, all, it's all, you know, very interesting and I absolutely love it. I think the least I like about being a physician is what I mentioned earlier. It's just a lot of kind of going through insurance and getting the insurance authorization and approvals. And sometimes it can be cumbersome, difficult, or slow things down. Cool. Yeah, I figured insurance would be in, the, in that <laughs> answer. So I uh, got a couple of questions left sure. from WW. What are some things you felt you had to sacrifice to get to where you are now? Any regrets? or rather anything you do differently? I remember when I was applying for general surgery residency and some of the attendings said, you know what, if you go into surgery residency, you know, it's, 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 it's tough. So you will get a, you're going to miss out on your friend's birthdays and, and going out and, and doing stuff like that. And, and for me, it, it really wasn't, um, that I, it wasn't really a big deal in terms of like having FOMO or I was missing out on things, but it definitely took time away from being with my family. And, um, you know, that, that's tough. Um, uh, cause you're just, you're just doing so much in residency and you're so tired and you're away from your family. So I, you know, I wish I didn't have to be away from them, um, for so long, but I'm, I'm happy that I'm now, 
uh, with them and essentially making up for lost time. I don't have, I can't really say that I have any regrets or I really do anything uh, def uh, differently. I, I knew that I, that if I was going to go into surgery, I definitely had to be super dedicated and make time for that. And, and luckily family and friends understood that because they knew how intensive the training is. Yeah. From everything you said, it sounds like surgery is, I mean, everything in medicine sounds like you're going to be all in, but with surgery, it's like really all in. You're really all in. You're knee deep. Okay. So last question and thank you guys for all the questions. Um, again, Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. So last thing is in your position now, knowing what you do, what would you say to yourself back when you started? I would say, you know, get as much exposure and experience. So when you are pre-med or a medical student, if you are at all interested or curious about a, an area, um, so for me it was surgery or breast surgery, try to get as much exposure to that, meaning participate in a research project, no matter how small your, or big your role is, shadow someone, you know, try and get that time in the hospital or the clinical setting, try to you know, talk with the residents or other med students to see kind of like, what, what is life like? Like, is that what you really want to go into? Um, the other biggest thing I would say is to believe in yourself, be confident. And it's also important to know what are your weaknesses and that can be hard i think uh you know for me and a lot of other people to identify that and and to see it in the face and say like okay i'm weak in this area i need to fix this how am i going to fix this so i can help improve myself and reach my goals and so i'd say you know you got to believe in yourself because there there can be people out there who are going to say, you know what, surgery is too difficult or, you know, breast surgery is too competitive or being a surgery surgeon in California is too competitive. And I was told this too. And guess what? I didn't listen to them. And I'm glad I didn't because I know that sometimes people, you know, listen and then they feel like, you know what, maybe they're right. Maybe I shouldn't apply. Maybe I shouldn't try. But, you know, I believed in myself and I was prepared and, and I knew what I needed to do to get where I needed to get. And, and I'm glad that I didn't listen to the naysayers. I took everything with a grain of salt and, and I said, you know what, let's go for it. Let's see what happens. And it is what it is. So I, I'm happy, you know, where I am today. Awesome. Yeah. It seems like if everybody listened to the naysayers, we'd have a lot less physicians in the United States for that matter. You only need to be admitted into one medical school, right? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, hey, Dr. Bonov, thank you again for taking the time out to talk to us. I learned a whole lot here. Thank you to everybody for uh, populating the comments. Um, yeah, again, thank you for speaking to us and teaching us about what you do. Thank you so much. I had a great time. Awesome. All right. Thanks, guys. Everybody have a good one.